The level hijacking is one of the most stealthiest techniques into achieving persistence lateral movement or page creation. It consists of um, implanting a DRL into a directory where executable can read it, and when that executable was a DRL, it actually was our malicious payload. It is considered more stealth because AVs and EDRs tend to have lower detection rates in the very same code implanted into DRL instead of an executable. Steps for reproducing DRL hijacking vulnerability are quite simple. First, you need to find the vulnerable DRL that you can write tags into that directory, meaning that you can place or replace your file. Then you need to craft your own DRL or use MSF Venom, for example, and then just swap the DRLs and simply execute the binary. Is that enough? No. It is simply not enough because, as you can see, I've executed the file I got my reverse shell up and running here, but the point is that the actual binary is not actually running. So that can be a problem. This is a huge indicator of compromise and it immediately is gonna result into someone calling back to the boot team or saying, well, what the heck is going on here? So we need a slightly more difficult approach. The demo you just saw works perfectly in simple pen tests where we can showcase if the actual binary is vulnerable or not, but, but in most relevant cases it's better to take us the step one step further and explain how the DRL is actually working and how we can bypass this limitation. Now this is the basic functionality of the DLL documented by Microsoft and it requires something called DLL main. Now in the normal binaries you have the main function from where all of your code starts but from DLL, you have what's called DLL main, and depending on what happens, meaning how the code of the DLL is being reached, you have a different execution methods. Now, by definition, you are attaching to a DLL in order to read functions, and the code here usually gets executed first. Now, what happens is that the default MSF Venom DLL is actually hijacking the thread because we are getting our reverse shell, and as soon as the thread is running, meaning as soon as the shell is alive, the executable is not really working. So we need to, in order to bypass that, we're gonna need to do a so-called DLL proxying, meaning that we can resume the execution of the DLL, moving out to different functions that are required from the binary initially. Now you may ask, how the heck I'm supposed to know all the functions that the binary needs in order to restore them after execution? Luckily, there are tools for that, and one of the tools is called Spartacus, and what that is doing is we define the path to procmon.exe, it's gonna automatically define the filters and it's gonna output all the DLLs hijackable and respectively their functions into a file. So I'm gonna run that, then the only thing I need to do is to open my DVTA, so here, here, release, run that. And by the way, it's gonna be best if I remove the prof API, so, my binary is being executed as normal so i'm gonna remove the shell from here then i'm gonna i'm gonna need to get rid of the dvta process so just like that and that then remove the prof api now run it again it runs normal and now do enter here so the output tells us a lot here it tries to see each of the data which is being loaded which of them are unique, which of them we have right access, and which of them can have ex exported functions. Now in that case, we see that cryptsp.dll, we did not export functions with that, but we did with lpdll, we did that with cryptbasedll, dll, which in our case is enough. So if I can do output.csv, this shows us everything we pretty much need. On top of that, depending on the functions that it was able to export, it generates a bunch of files. If I open up Explorer, we have a CPP files for each of the DLL that the tool was able to export the functions. For that case, I can use, for example, cryptsp.dll, and if I open that with C++, we have all the functions exported here, so all that pragma command something is exporting all the functions the binary actually needs and wants from the DLL. Then it has the section for our payload here, and then it has its own DLL main, pretty much coding the structure of our malicious DLL. Now is the time to get into it a bit more coding because MSF Venom would not do a trick here, so let's get into C++. Now let's start by analyzing the code we have during my stream. If you haven't watched the video, you can find it in the video description. So in the stream we did all that thing in life, then we have learned how the process really worked. 
Now here, of course, we have all the defined functions, export functions, sorry, we need in order for our DLL to work as expected. Then we're gonna need to define all the libraries for our shell code runner to be working fine. And the core of our malicious DLL is the same shell code runner I have in my previous video, which you can watch it here on the top right corner. Now I'm not gonna get into details of how exactly that shell code runner works because I've already explained it there, but I'm gonna get into details of our DLL main because that thing is crucial. Now here, this is the standard DLL main we get from Spartacus or from the official Microsoft documentation. But the important thing to note here is that we need to use the API call for create handle in order to create new handle and not to hijack the current one. Because if we hijack the current one, we saw that the, the actual binary is not starting unless the shell code is actually terminated. Now that can cause all disruptions during the program, but if we use a dedicated thread just for our show code runner, we, are, we of course bypass all of things and making the executable works just normally and behave just normal. So that's the code. With that create thread, we are just going to start a new thread and we're pointing out to our run function. That run function contains our show code runner, which is gonna start it as hidden window. It's gonna create a shared object of a file map, and then it's gonna execute it by pointing the pointer to the to the beginning of the stack. Now, I think it's time for testing. Now, in order to easily compile the DLL, I use Visual Studio, and after loading the file, I'm just gonna press Control Shift P in Visual Studio 2017, and it's gonna auto compile the code. Now we can see we have some files, we have an error because we need to delete some signature files for the DLL. In that case, I can go here, I can find the file it needs, so it's in x64. Release. And then DLL1.ipdp, I'm gonna delete that and then try to compile again. And now it generates successfully. Now we have our DLL here, which should work as expected. I'm gonna copy the DLL right into the DVTA path and just typed it as cryptsp.dll. So I'm gonna do cryptsp.dll. Now let's see what happens if after I execute the binary. So I'm gonna close my current one. I'm gonna make sure I have my listener up and running on the card machine. So ncmvop. Then go there and cross my fingers and run the binary so run that we have the binary is being started if i go to here i have my before show up and running why that happened once again because we started a new thread which is dedicated for our shell code runner and not hijacking the current thread for the executable that helps the executable to first load all the functions we exported here so it knows from where to get them, but simultaneously to execute our shellcode, resulting in of us getting a C2 callback into our machine. And finally, the best part of the video comes where we're gonna test how that DLL actually behaves against various AV solutions. Now the point is to know that that we do not really use as much version as we should. We're not encrypting the shell code. We're not staging the shell code. We're not doing many more stuff that can help us evade AV, but we're just using a DLL. So I'm curious how much detection can just a single DLL has with all the malicious signatures inside. So currently I'm expecting huge detection rate, but the test is gonna show up now. And we have 30 out of 26. And to be honest, that's a lot because there, the DLL itself have the raw shell code in MSF Venom, that's the raw MSF Venom shell code. And even though it's not encrypted and stored here, it's still get, not getting flagged by half of the vendors, which in my case is huge. And I'm sure if we implement more evasion techniques, we can get even to zero. So thank you everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video and stay tuned for more.